Um, welcome everyone to Building Consensus. Uh, this is the third um, and last of three classes that have been designed for IETF um, working group chairs. And I would also say for those who work with working groups um, in general. And the development, I say this every time, but we have new people here, but the development of these classes was highly collaborative with an IETF advisory group um, that included former and former working group chairs. And I just wanna um, thank you all in advance since this is the final class and we will more than likely run out of time um, at the end. So I just wanna say thank you um, in advance for your participation and engagement um, in these trainings. My name is Dewana Williamson, um, and I also led the training that was conducted last year. And the topics are consistent, but th these trainings have received an intense makeover um, from last year. And it's my hope that this one in particular will resonate um, with the group. And if, if you are new to the group, like, or I shouldn't say new, but if this is your first time attending this, um, tr the training in this time frame, can you please say your name, um, where you're located, and if you are a working group chair, how long you've been one, and if not, what you specifically um, do um, in the IETF? Okay, I can start. My name is Natalie Treneman. I am based in the Netherlands and I am a not a working group chair. I'm a secretary for the uh, Cider Ops working group for the last four or five years, something like that. Nice to meet you, Natalie. All right, is there anyone else who's first time attending this time frame or this training? Okay, then we'll move on. Thank you. Um, so this class is again about building consensus. Um, my plan is for it to be highly collect interactive. Um, so if you feel so inclined, I'd love for you to um, to come on camera if you if you can do that. Um, and if you want to, um, the slides are content dense, so I'll highlight points. Um, and then you're welcome to jump in if you have questions or if you want to elaborate or discuss. Um, in addition, there are slides and questions at the end of each section. But I do um, just want to say that the value in this class is not in me talking, but it's in you all um, talking um, to each other since you all are actually the ones, um, you know, engaged in this work. So I just want to add that I don't know that there's much value in hearing me talk through a lot, but there is a lot of value when you all um, speak and talk to, um, to each other and ask each other questions. So on our agenda, we'll talk about working group chair characteristics, consensus-based decision-making, um, getting to rough consensus, humming for consensus, and then we'll have a, um, a discussion um, at, the, at the end. And again, um, there'll be discussion in between um, as well. So this, this first section um, that I'm going to talk through on work group chair characteristics is actually taken for, from questions um, that were asked of experienced working group chairs and area directors when we first started um, developing this training in 2021. And the following questions um, were asked um, and this data actually is really the responses to the, the questions, but um, there were four questions and they were, what are good chairing skills for IETF chairs? Um, when you think about what, what chairs that have done the job um, very well, what made them different? 
Um, think about it behaviorally. What did they say that made them more successful than the others in the role? And if you were going to mentor a, a new chair, what are the three most important things that you would tell them um, to keep in mind? And again, this section kind of summarizes what some of those, um, what those responses were. So integrity um, is a critical characteristic to demonstrate as a working group chair. Chairs must distinguish and publicly state the separation between their personal opinions from their official role um, as a working group chair. And having commitment is important as well. The responsibilities go beyond face-to-face -face meeting and chairs must be willing to do administrative tasks as well as managing those the complicated um, working group dynamics. And also um, an important skill is to um, have the ability to ensure momentum by pressing the working group to continuously make progress and honor um, scheduling constraints. And this must be done from the lens of the IETF as a volunteer organization. So everybody, um, participants are volunteering and your way of you know, influence and ensuring momentum really has to be rooted in the fact that people don't have to, they do it because they desire to, desire to and so there are different ways um, or diff different ways that you'll need to um, act in order to encourage people to do things that they are volunteering to do and kind of do um, outside of their, of their normal work in a lot of cases. It's important that an IETF chair has the interpersonal skills um, to encourage and influence um, participants to help complete working group tasks. So um, a chair must have the planning skills and they must be good at following up with tasks and communicating effectively to the entire working group. And also there, um, there is this um, understanding that working group members can participate in different modalities. Um, they have strong opinions, different levels of familiarity or history with the work and have a different level of comfort in different communication styles. And with all of this, the work group chair needs to make accommodations and strike a balance to ensure that all of the contributing um, voices are heard just based on the different ways in which people um, participate and contribute. One of the most important duties of the working group chair is being able to take a wide set of opinions and summarize them accurately and to mute the repeating or um, settle issues. This is critical to ensuring participants have a common understanding, which is key. And the working group chair must have or develop skills to judge consensus. So you must be able to read a room correctly. You must be able to focus discussions and then make complicated decisions when someone is in the rough. As a chair, you need must communicate consistently and clearly. And as one working group chair put it, the working group chair needs to face the fact that he, she, or they have moved from being a technical expert to being a technical manager. Um, and running a working group needs managerial and communication skill as much as technical skills. I think that's a really um, important point. We'll talk a little bit about that in the um, in the discussion, but it sounds like there are a different set of skills needed, um, more leadership skills needed in order to facilitate um, a working group in, in addition to the technical skills. So transparency means ensuring that the processes for decisions, moderation, and participation in the working group is understood by all the participants. 
and where appropriate and subject to discussion, outcomes and decisions are documented. And this also means like, that if you have private deliberations, that those are made public or held in public. And, um, and when appropriate, this standard is consistently applied. Working group chairs must create a productive partnership with their co-chairs. And um, I've heard many of you say that it is um, helpful to have um, co-chairs when um, leading a working group. And you must leverage that relationship on behalf of getting the best outcomes for the IETF. So in coordination between these chairs is key to working group success. The, the most successful chairs are those who um, have respect and recognize the community. They are good process facilitators and administrators, and they keep the work moving um, in, a, in a fair way. They take every opportunity to acknowledge and say thank you to the community and they're humble um, and gracious and continue to thank people for their voluntary um, participation. Uh, uh, an effective chair also calls out um, undesirable um, behavior and they model the appropriate behaviors for professional engagement and they call attention when these standards um, are not met. And modeling it is good, but calling it out sometimes in others can be, um, can be even more um, important. And, and uh, uh, an important aspect of being a great working group chair is having situational awareness as well. Um, so situational, situational awareness of other things that are actually happening in the IETF and the broader um, ecosystem. And a, a good chair links, contextualizes, and brings that to the attention of the working group um, as, as is appropriate. And they also act as a champion um, for the working group in the IETF and in the community to raise awareness um, of the work. And again, these are all things that experienced chairs um, said in response to those um, questions that I, um, that I mentioned earlier. But I wanna pause here and stop talking and um, give you all a chance to to, to jump in, but, and my first question to the group would be, are there chair characteristics that you think are missing from anything that, that I've said? And if so, what would you add? That was quite a lot. I wish I could be one such coach uh, any time in the future. Yeah, I think it's um, I you know when any time you ask people's you know thinking and what they've seen over years of experience, there's going to be a, a laundry list. And a lot of times, I imagine that it's aspirational. But does anybody think there's anything missing? And if there's nothing missing, what do you think are our most, Im most important chair characteristics? I know you guys don't want to hear me the whole time. So I really would oh, love to one, participate. Yeah, one thing that comes to my mind is also picking a chair who can work behind the scene uh, as well, like a skill that is needed that sometimes we focus too much on what happens on the session and what's happening, like, you know, which is in a public discussion, but sometimes to keep the working group moving, we need a lot of behind the scene and direct communication with authors, direct communications with AD, direct communication with people who are opposing an ideas so that we better facilitate the conversation that happens in the open. So I think this skill to work behind the scene uh, would also be something that I would like to uh, see added. That makes a lot of sense. Probably in that same section, 
the network of relationship that the chair has or could have with uh, area directors, mm -hmm. VSG in general, could come in handy. Yeah, I think that coordination part where we are currently focusing mainly with the co-working group chairs, maybe that coordination also expands to other working group chairs, research groups, area directors, IAB, like, you know, be more connected to what's happening with the rest of the ITF and IRTF. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have a um, time when you learned, when you had to lean into um, a specific characteristic in a working, like any of these things that were mentioned here, have there been times or do you have like specific examples when you had to really lean into that, into that skill in order to, um, to get something done within the working group? Does this resonate with people? Are people in agreement in general with this or do you have some differences in thinking here? I was thinking just to give it a little bit more context uh, at the creation time of a working group. That's why you need those kind of connections. To set the initial charter, make sure the work doesn't overlap with something that's already on this way. Mm. Try to find what area is the best home for that topic. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that reminds me like of the kind of, I guess, kind of the coordination too that Daruf was kind of um, thinking of. It makes me kind of think of that when you say that, Dominique. Okay, I am going to, to move on. Let's talk about consensus-based decision-making. And again, I'll stop at the end of this section so we can, um, so that we can, can talk a little bit. Um, this, the, the content in this section was taken from RFC 7282. So, in determining consensus, the key is to separate those choices that are simply unappealing from those that are actually um, problematic. And if at the end of the discussion, people have not gotten to the choice that they prefer, but they're convinced that the chosen solution is acceptable, maybe, but maybe less appealing, they have still come to um, consensus or come to a consensus. And consensus doesn't require that everyone is happy and that everyone agrees with the solution um, or, or that they agree that the solution, that the solution, that the chosen solution is the best one. Consensus is when everyone is sufficiently satisfied with the chosen solution such that they no longer have any objections um, to it. And consensus requires active engagement and eventual support um, of, of the participants who are working on that solution. So getting to agreement is, is not enough because people might agree that a solution is acceptable and have no objection to it. But if they don't actively think it's a good and correct outcome, then the group um, technically has not come to consensus. When using consensus-based decision-making in the, the IETF, you're always weighing trade-offs and collectively choosing the best, the set of, that best meets the full set of requirements. So this is how compromise should be used in getting to the best outcomes, but compromise can be problematic when it's between people and it involves seeding your opinion because you don't have the energy to continue to argue the point. 
Um, and in this case, a person has just capitulated, um, which means the, the group has not truly reached consensus. And the working group has basically quit because you don't have the energy or desire to keep discussing or, or debating the, the, the issue. When we talked about, we heard this from people um, last week, week, it may not have been during this time frame, but we heard kind of this how things get drawn out and ultimately you can lose participation and, um, and come to decisions because people are not necessarily engaging the way, like the way they were in the, in the beginning. So again, to this point of, of quitting because you don't have the energy, people don't always have the energy to continue. Ultimately, the goal of consensus is to get the best technical um, and or procedural decisions. And consensus is the tool, it's not the ultimate um, outcome. And as I know you all are aware, getting to consensus takes patience from the participants and even more so um, from you. It takes discernment and good judgment in order to know that the group has arrived at consensus. And as I mentioned before, it's always helpful to have um, a co-chair or others to help um, navigate the process. When debate becomes contentious, um, working group chairs have to work towards cooling the discussion. So intervene in these situations. Don't let them continue unproductively um, because this can influence future uh, interactions with the group. Okay, let's talk um, a little bit. What are some of the challenges you have experienced in the consensus building process? Uh, this is Jean, and this is probably a rare occurrence, but um, I'm co-chair of a small working group, and the work almost was AD-sponsored. Uh, it, it wasn't that much work, but a small working group was spun up. Um, I've had difficulty getting anybody to say anything about, hey, working group, shall we adopt this draft? in silence um and you know it was talked about in a working group session at an ietf meeting and people were okay with it then but trying to take it back to the list um and i've had to say well okay um after the deadline i have not heard from anyone um i'm going to you know gave them an extension to the deadline and say if I hear no objections, this is adopted. Mm -hmm. This was a working group deliverable, and I heard no objections. And I did clear it with the area director before I presented it that way. Yeah. So um, in my case, building consensus was, uh, well, nobody's objecting. Nobody has feedback. But as I said, uh, it was a small amount of work and it, it was yeah. not controversial. Yeah, we go ahead, Nathalie, I see your hand up. Yeah, um, we, we experienced the same in our working group. Uh, it's uh, somebody comes with a proposal. Um, yeah, um, you ask for working group adoption, complete silence. You ask again, complete silence. Is that then consensus? Is that a yes? Is that a no? How do you deal with that? Um, uh, as well as for other calls in the process, uh, what do you do if there's no response? Yeah, how have others handled? I mean, Jean gave an example of silence. Are there other thoughts on how you handle that silence? Uh, one thing which, uh, like, you know, I have been doing in my working group is like, this is a very known problem sometimes even in busy working groups because the work starts, work cooks up. And then when we are actually judging consensus at the last stages, we see a very fizzled out, uh, like, you know, not many uh, responses. 
So we have to do remind people that this is how we do our processes in the working group. This step is very important as much as all the other discussions that have happened. So I think like, you know, just reminding people and getting on it and saying that this is very important. In fact, sometimes even saying the document will not go ahead. And like, you know, we have to drop the, all the work that we are doing until this decision is made. So having those kind of strict deadlines and sometimes doing like, you know, uh, involving the AD and like, you know, saying that this is very important and mm -hmm. we need uh, like clarification on the list as help sometimes, but it's an always a constant process in some places and some places where like, you know, the, dis the discussion is very hot and there's a lot of interest. Those goes through very <laughs> smoothly. <laughs> Yeah, what do, I don't want to. Does anybody else have anything to 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 add to that? I I think just it is it is difficult navigating volunteer you know structures and like to the point that it takes patience and time. And to Daru's point, continuing to remind people, tell them how important it is. I don't know what else there is to do, but with if others have, you know, thoughts or examples, um, that would be, please say what they are. When there is a, like a time frame, though, are when, and you make people aware of that, when you, are there times when you just have to extend that? Or if, if you haven't come to um, to consensus or like what actually happens if you don't reach consensus? Do you end up starting from the beginning? So there are times where we have done the extension, but again, with the reasonable time frame. Uh, uh, but at sometimes we have just like, you know, dropped the document even and said that we will revisit it when there is an interest back in the group and we make the document as part until we get like an enough participation from the working group, we will not progress because we are not just here to push the documents. There has to be an interest from the working group. So sometimes those have helped, sometimes they haven't. So there is no fixed formula that can be applied. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think it's, it's uh, sometimes uh, also useful, in particular, if you don't have a working group that is created for a specific document, um, but if there is an actual adoption process uh, to make sure that you identify uh, reviewers at the adoption time. So you don't adopt the document unless you have a couple of people who have volunteered to be reviewers. Uh, realistically, not all of them will actually then do that. But if you have a set of like five uh, people who have volunteered to do reviews, then it's much easier to, to get reasonable feedback uh, from, from the working group. And once a reviewer has identified an issue, then it's uh, often possible to get more, more input uh, on that issue. But the, the threshold to actually reading the whole document and, and uh, stating an opinion, that, that appears to be pretty high. Mm. Yeah, I think this assigning reviewers is something that I think uh, if, like we have also discussed, like every time some authors during the, when we go to working group session, we usually have a slide from everyone, adopt my document, adopt my document. And we were thinking like, you know, at one time, like anybody who asked for adopting, adopting a document must review somebody else's work because you're not here just to uh, present your work. You are here to also give output to others. And we were for a minute thinking that maybe we should have a process of everyone who's asking for adoption must review a document at the same time. That, yeah, I mean, that, sound, that sounds motivating, that's for sure. Okay, all right, let's go move on. Let's talk about um, getting to rough consensus. And rough consensus is achieved when all issues are addressed but not necessarily accommodated. Um, let's talk about full consensus first. And coming to full consensus is when everyone comes to the conclusion that either 
the objections are valid and therefore make a change to address the objection or that the objection was not really important and just a, a matter of preference. This is why the IETF does not require full consensus because that would allow one individual um, to stop progress and make it almost impossible to get to a decision. Ultimately, one person would have the ability to determine the, the final outcome, is, which is not what you, um, what you want. Rough consensus is achieved when all the issues are addressed, but not necessarily accommodated. So often a working group will enter an objection where everyone understands the issue and acknowledges that it is a, a shortcoming in the proposed solution. But the working group in general believes that accommodating the objection is not worth the trade-off of fixing the, the, the problem. And if the chair finds in their technical judgment that the issue has been fully considered and that the working group has come to the conclusion that the trade-off is not worth making, then even with continued objection from the person who raised the issue, the chair can declare that the group has come to rough consensus. As the working group does its, <clears throat> excuse me, as the working group does its work and makes its choices, it works to achieve full consensus um, and tries to get all issues addressed to everyone's satisfaction, even those who um, originally had objections. So you're working towards full consensus. Um, that is the ideal, um, but it treats and so you treat rough consensus as a default to deal with cases where the person objecting still feels strongly that the objection is well-founded and should be reconciled. So, and a, a key point here, and we've brought it up, is um, that a conclusion of having only rough consensus relies heavily on the judgment, a good judgment um, of the chair. The chair of a working group who's about to find there is only rough consensus will need to make the determination that no, not only has the working group fully considered the objection, but that it um, also fully examined the, the consequences um, of not making a change to accommodate the objection. And they are basically saying that the outcome does not constitute a failure to meet the technical requirements of the work. So not accommodating um, this um, objection is not a failure to meet the technical requirements um, of the work. I think that's an important point. So in order to do this, though, the chair will need to have a good idea of the purpose and architecture of the work that's being done. And so perhaps the chair will need to refer to the charter of the working group, um, sometimes referring to previously published requirements documents or even consulting with other experts um, on the, the topic. And then the chair can use their own technical judgment to make sure that the solution does meet um, the requirements. And it's possible that a chair can come to the wrong conclusion. Um, and the chair's conclusion is always appealable um, should that occur, but the chair has to use their, their judgment um, in most cases. While counting heads, we're going to talk a little bit about counting heads. Um, counting heads might give a good guess as to what the rough consensus will be, but it can't be seen as a way to determine consensus. Um, counting heads is a tool to provide um, directional guidance and it can help inform where you as a chair might need to direct the conversation. Uh, one of the strengths though of the consensus model is that minority views are addressed and using rough consensus should not take away from that. Any finding of rough consensus needs to provide an explanation to the person who brought forth the issue of why their concern is not going to be addressed in the final product. 
And a good outcome is that the individual understands the decision being made and they accept the, the outcome, even though their particular issue is not accommodated um, in, the, in the final solution. In short, um, consensus building is a tool for making the best decisions. There's no majority rule. Um, and the objective is always to get to the best technical solution. If, a, if in the end a chair feels consensus or rough consensus has been reached, like there are a few technical and tactical things that must be done, you must call or declare consensus. And if someone objects, objects and asks for reconsideration, you as a chair must allow for that. And ultimately, when you declare consensus, it should be after all objections have been considered and addressed. And again, this is um, a judgment. This is the chair's judgment call. Okay, let's talk a little bit. What are some challenges you all have encountered arriving at rough consensus? We want one problem with judging consensus is that there are actually two thresholds that the specification must take. Uh, one is the, the matter of technical excellence that, that you essentially refer to. But of course, the, the other is the issue of deployability. And if you have uh, uh, constituencies or representatives of uh, constituencies uh, in the group that, that uh, indicate uh, this is not going to be deployed in, in area X. Um, yeah, you're you essentially leaving the technical field and uh, uh, come into a situation where you actually need to initiate negotiation uh, between the, the working group uh, members. And that's actually one place where we're going behind the scenes is uh, often the, the useful thing. Uh, to do. But in the end, um, a technically excellent uh, solution that, that nobody wants to uh, deploy because it, it uh, kills their business model or something, mm -hmm. um, that, that doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I would kind of argue then if that's the, if a solution is actually not deployable, like if it's not adoptable, then it doesn't sound like it's actually the best technical solution. Seems like that has to be a foundation of being the best solution that it can be deployed. Yeah, again, these are, these may be non-technical aspects. Yeah. So uh, like whose but patent is in there? And, and things like that. And also assessing the fact that it can or cannot be deployed maybe outside of the expertise of the members of the group. Mm -hmm. mm. That's a good push. Are there um, other examples or challenges that others have experienced in arriving at rough consensus? Or have others even experienced this deployability challenge? Oh, one thing that comes to my mind is like, uh, uh, when we have a consensus for a single document or a single solution and there are objections, I find that process like much easier to handle, but when we have like competing documents and imagine there are competing solutions, which both says that we are getting adopted and getting into a common solution that has always been a much harder solution because I think it, because it's much more deviates from like uh, a pure technical objection. It becomes more like when you are comparing two solutions. And it is no longer just a comparison of objection versus uh, what you achieve, but then you are comparing which are the two solutions uh, are better. 
and there some of the things could be technical some of things could be preferences sometimes you are optimizing one over the other and uh, just getting to a consensus in that case is always much harder so mm-hmm. even if other chairs or other folks on the call have any thoughts on that we good to hear Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Maybe it's just <laughs> me. <laughs> Maybe it's just you, Daru. Nobody else has. That. No. <laughs> I think I think the case you described is valid. I I, I think I can think of a working group that was created just to. Allow two different solutions to be developed uh, to solve the same problem, as an example. <laughs> that might be an extreme case where consensus could not be achieved. Did you say they document? They ended up documenting both solutions. I didn't. Und- it's that okay. Yeah. And even even worse than that, they ended up creating a separate working group so that each. Uh, group uh, of advocates could build their own solution mm. even two, two different working groups but solving the same problem right that's it yeah that as, sounds as far as i can tell it's not quite my main area of expertise but seen from a distance it looks like they're doing the same thing oh wow it's that's a actually hard hard to to say whether two solutions solve the same problem uh, because they may have different areas of applicability and then somebody wants to to optimize for environment one and the other one wants to optimize for environment two so are they solving the same problem well if you ignore the environment yes but <laughs> otherwise no and, so the, the the question and, is really do we need to standardize um, agree on a simple solution in the ITF, or can we let the marketplace decide? Mm-hmm. And the the um, ITF has not been very consistent about uh, this particular question. Uh, I think in one cases, what happens is sometimes people go ahead and implement solutions and start deploying them. And once you have started deploying them before it is an RFC, and then changing the position becomes very, very hard. And I think even the ITF and working group chairs becomes a little, when uh, like the service provider comes that we have already gone ahead and deployed this. And are you going to, what are you going to do? <laughs> are, you, are we going to just keep going it and deploying it? So it becomes very hard for us to handle as chairs. What do we do in these situations? That and then nobody familiar. buys because now people have put in their money as well. And yep. this is like, you know, real products, real this thing. It becomes very hard. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I cut somebody off. No, it, yeah, I was just totally in agreement. We have that in our working group as well. And, and it's not, a, not always pretty what happens then. Okay, this is our um, our last section. We'll talk about um, humming for consensus. And again, this is taken from um, RFC 7282. <clears throat> so humming should be the start of a conversation, not the end, and just want to reiterate that it is it is not voting. Um, and there is no voting, and I know you all already know this, but it was really elaborated on in RFC 7282, so I just want to um, want to um, focus on it a little bit here, but there is no voting in the IETF. And one reason is that voting can, can actually be seen as impossible because you're not a membership organization. So people don't belong to the IETF, they participate. And often experts who are not necessarily involved in the IETF are recruited to help um, develop solutions, which is another um, signal Um, is another point that signals that there are no IETF um, members. 
So the chair could get the temperature of the room by doing a show of hands and knowing who specifically feels one way or another, and it can help them guide the conversation, but it could also signal some form of voting. And the advantage of a hum is that it makes it perfectly clear that the chair is simply figuring out the direction of the, of the conversation. Um, and I also, I do wanna differentiate polling from voting because a chair might use some form of polling to provide guidance directionally on how to center the conversation. And because you can't hum on a mailing list, some form of polling might be done um, to get some directional um, guidance. Uh, sometimes the hum will make it clear that choice A has a significant um, more support or has significant more support than choice B and is therefore likely easier to start, start the discussion by saying, for example, um, a seems to have quite a bit of support. Let's have people think B is a bad idea. Come up and tell us why it's problematic. And at that point, the working group can start going through the issues and see if any of them are non-negotiables. It could always turn out that one of the objections is instantly recognized by the entire group as a you know, detrimental flaw in A and the group will then turn to a discussion on the merits or the demerits of option B instead. Then there could be a group of people who are not strongly committed to option B and might have no real technical objection to option A, even though it's not their first preference. So there's always a chance that this could be misleading or even abused because some people are willing to hum more loudly than others, just sometimes just because of personality, or that one of the quieter hums actually turns out to be a non-negotiable that makes the original choice impossible. The chair, as a chair, you could always be surprised because the hum turns out to be unanimous and no further discussion is needed. Um, but otherwise, the hum begins the discussion. It does not. Um, it does not end it. It is a directional um, cue for the for the working group. And always remember that all final decisions must go to the mailing list, and that helps to ensure and encourage transparency for everyone, for all participants. Okay. Does anyone have an example of a time you called for a hum? Um, why did you call for it? Um, what happened and how did the hum inform what you did next? I think Drew is uh, making a good point that we're not, I don't think we're still using humming in rooms. Uh, because of the remote participation. So it's slightly different with the Miteco tool. So technically, it, it, it's it, uh, is it still a hum? Yeah, I think like this brings out a good question because according to our processes, we are still, most time we are not, like you know, we don't think of even the Miteco tool as a direct poll per se. Like, uh, we are also, some working group used to like the idea of raise the hand to get the feeling of the room and versus using the hum. So I kind of sometimes think of even the uh, the meat echo tool maybe is like no more like raise your hand rather than the, the humming part. But the concept is still the same that we should not go so much by exact numbers, but just what is the feeling of the room. Yeah. The, and the media uh, tool is truly anonymous. If we get uh, 30 uh, hums for solution A and 20 hums for solution B, th there is no way to, to decide. That's not, not a useful uh, feedback. If we get 30 for solution A and, and three for solution B, uh, then a hum is, is a good way to uh, beat the three people into submission? No, to ask them uh, why they particularly um, disagree. 
So uh, actually finding the people who, who mm -hmm. disagree and why they disagree is a potential useful outcome of a hub. That makes total sense. Well, so then what about on the, on, so I know humming is face-to-face, -face, but is the, um, the Micho tool something that can be, do, you, what do you do from a mailing list perspective? Uh, I think in the mailing list, it's pretty straightforward. There, uh, what we call is like, you know, we use the word consensus poll, where we, say, we put out clear questions to the working group. Are we ready to adopt this? And if not, please state your objection. So I think it's much more clearer uh, on the mailing list. Uh, okay. In the meeting, earlier we used to do this humming, which was like, you know, just to get a feeling of the room. Now, what, what the chairs need to do is, maybe have a skill of forming a very good question for the meet echo, which is more of raise your hands uh, like a tool. So you frame a question and then you ask the group who is ready to raise a hand uh, uh, in a particular way. So the, what chairs needs to know is how to crisply write that information clearly for both people in the room and uh, remote. Got it. And it has the additional benefit of being truly anonymous compared to physically raising your hand. So mm -hmm. it solves a little bit of what the humming was designed for, meaning you know, people in a few meters away from you won't uh, be able to dis to say or to decide if you hummed for or did not hum, mm -hmm. which you achieve with the meter control. Great, we'll need to revise that then in this training. There, I think we might have time um, for, for this. We were, um, I was planning to have a, um, a, another quick um, discussion. Um, and this is a, um, what would you do differently? This actually was taken directly from RFC 7282, but if you, I'll give you a minute to read it. Um, and then I'd like to get your thoughts on what you would do differently in this situation. And give me a, a, a thumbs up when you have finished reading it. Okay, so I invite, looks like people have read it. I invite anyone to kind of jump in and say what they would do differently in this case. Well, maybe that, that's the discovery phase and, and then you have to go in, into a decision-making making phase. Um, I think it's a, this is not a particularly great way to run the discovery phase. Um, but in the decision-making phase, uh, what can be helpful is to have some uh, well-defined objectives. Uh, so you can actually rate uh, option A and option B against the, those objectives. Uh, obviously, we are running into the classical requirements engineering problem here that um, people who, who favor a particular solution will uh, favor the objectives that, that are only solved by that uh, solution. So it's not... Uh, uh, not easy to to get around willful slowing mm -hmm. down the process, but for people who um, just have a preference and aren't quite aware uh, why they have that preference or what the consequences are, this can be a useful exercise. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, in in the constraint world and and even in the header compression world before that. Um, we often had objectives that, that were uh, 
uh, described in the number of bytes that are actually transferred. And if you have a solution that, that uses 20% uh, more than the other, and, and uh, th th there actually is a strong, a strong objective to optimize this, uh, then it's easy to decide. Mm. Go ahead. Well, Go in, in, the, in the text you've presented, uh, I noticed that the questions are expressed uh, as a closed question. Are you okay? Which uh, prompts for an answer, yes or no. And asking the two opposite question in a closed form is a sure recipe to having people discontent with the answer. So I would probably formulate things a bit more open to get started, uh, like comparing, the, you know, like stating it looks like uh, A um, has the most uh, attraction in a group. Uh, can anybody object serious uh, disadvantages of B over A? And you don't lock people into saying yes or no immediately. Yep, great point. Go ahead, yes. Karan. Yeah, what I have observed in uh, three or four different situations now that design teams are being formed where both um, proponents of both the solutions are brought together to work on a common document. I think this happened for uh, a segment routing case where you wanted to work on programmable headers. Then this happened in a T's group where there were different approaches of how network slices should be implemented and a design team was initially formed to uh, bring a comprehensive one way of looking at things and later on it has happened in MPLS design team also. So that seems to be one approach that is commonly used within uh, ITF these days. I'm not sure that it is fully productive, but it is definitely a much better approach than just choosing between A and B, because this way you get all the people in the room together to openly discuss those things. And some of those things can be taken off the list to reduce the noise. And people have, since now it's a smaller group, people are more open in discussing rather than hesitating on the mailing list. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to add the approach. Yes. It's extremely helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, we are um, at the end. I think thank you for engaging and um, participate, participating, especially in this last uh, discussion, hearing some um, different voices. And it's always, I think it's always helpful to hear um, what people have used and done in the past. So please, you'll receive a survey um, at the end of class. Um, when you um, log off, you'll receive it in an email, I think. So please just make sure that you take it and give your thoughts on, um, on what you like, what you didn't like um, in an effort to, um, to improve things for others. So thank you again, everybody for your participation and um, have a good rest of your day or evening.